I made so much money. That was pretty sick. That's Cal Freezy, YouTube mastermind and co-founder of The Fellas Studios, the fastest growing podcast network in the UK. In this episode, Callum reveals the content strategy that took his channel from 1,000 to 4 million subscribers. In a slightly weird way, YouTube is starting to reward authenticity versus Mr. Beastifying videos. What it's really like working with the sidemen. Talk to me about your relationship with the sidemen. Oh man, it's it's the best. For someone like KSI who's in the position that he was in, it might sound a bit weird, but you could probably speak to most of the other guys and they'll all tell you like what he's got. They don't want anything to do with that. Hmm. The behind the scenes secrets to making a viral video. We'll think about an idea, but if we can't marry it up with a really good title and a thumbnail to accompany that, we have to park it off to the side is absolutely key to really scaling anything and loads more i messaged max fosh i said like mate i remember seeing a clip of you saying that you have a choir and he was there like i need a bit more information mate like, what are you wanting us to do you may know cal Freezy for his funny videos and r-rated jokes but trust me he is one of the smartest creators operating out there today and you are not going to want to miss this i really hope you enjoy it if you do please subscribe and let's dive in cool cal Freezy, thanks so much for doing this man uh, thank you very much for having me on i'm excited to be here yeah, I'm really excited to be here uh, to be here with you because I think a lot of people will know you from YouTube where you've got 4.8 million subs. Yeah. But there's a lot about you that I think people don't realize. I text someone before this who knows you quite well and he said, "Yeah, like you look at his YouTube channel and you think there's a lot of funny videos here. He's an entertainer. That's what people know him for, but he's actually one of the smartest creators on the platform and more than Thank that you. like he's a super smart entrepreneur and what you're doing with the fella studios is pretty insane thank um, you um so i'd love to use this uh, conversation to to dive into maybe a bit of both of those worlds so yeah, absolutely like where where did where did it start for you with youtube yeah i think uh, I mean, it started when I was 15. So we're talking 13, 14 years ago. Um, and it all started with gaming videos. I mean, back oops, back then, um, there was no such thing as Google AdSense. There was no such thing as making money off of a video. It was all purely hobby driven. Um, and I was a 15 year old, loved playing Call of Duty. And I actually loved watching other people playing Call of Duty. And more importantly, I wanted to be better at the game so that when I was playing with my friends, I, you know, I was up there. I wasn't holding the team back. So I would search in like tips and tricks, all this type of stuff. Um, and I came across a community online that were making YouTube videos. So after about the sort of like six months to a year of watching that, I was there like, you know what? I'm just going to give this a go. Now, squeaky voiced me at like 15, 16. I, I was very fortunate that my friends at school were, were actually supportive of this because if you can imagine the idea of telling somebody at school, you make YouTube videos about, you know, 12, 13 years ago, you were quite literally just laughed out the room, like no way, da, da, da. The school find, finds your videos, all this sort of stuff. And so I went through school, but I was very lucky, like I said, that I had a good group of friends because it's very easy at that point to say, yeah, sack this off. There's, there's no way I'm doing it. Um, but I persevered. Um, I ended up getting enough money for something called a HD PVR. And that was essentially the HD version of the Dazzle. So I was only ever up, uh, able to upload, I think it was genuinely like 240p. Like we're talking, it was a tough watch, right? Yeah. Um, and so yeah, I got the HD PVR and then I could upload in 720. So I did that for a while, moved into like the FIFA stuff. That was all going really well. Um, uh, met a lot of friends along the way. Um, uh, most of my friends are, are through this space, but we've all known each other for 10 plus years. We all did the same thing. I moved down to London with um, a couple of the other guys that did it. One of the guys that I'd only ever met once before um, and the other guy I'd never met before. So it was a total gamble. I'm trying to tell your parents at 18 that you're going to move down to London with a, someone you never met. That's, that's a pretty tough sell, but um, went down there started that whole thing. And then from the gaming side of things, just I've been quite fortunate in the sense that people have 
have, have watched me regardless of what I've done and they've sort of grown up with me. So as uh, when I was younger gaming, then moved into like football videos, a lot of challenge videos. And that's where we really saw a massive spike in growth. And then, you know, I'm skipping a lot here, but we, we the lockdown came along. Yeah. And lockdown was when I started my podcast and we mentioned it before. I feel like everybody during lockdown was there like, you know what? People just need to hear what I have to say. Every, every man and their dog uh, decided to start a podcast and I was one of them. Uh, so I started it with my good friend, um, Chip, and we just started it. And when I say like the size of the room, we built the, So one of the conditions that Chip had given me was like, I'm only going to do this podcast if I can build a set. We were in the very fortunate position where we had some disposable income to invest in in a set like this. Um, and I think we had about £6,000 for our first set. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that was mandatory for me. In order for me to do a podcast with Chip, this had to be done. And so we said, right, we're going to do this. We're going to rent a space in central London. And I know the people listening or the people watching can't really see it, but it was about the size. The room was about the size of this carpet like this this cream one here was tiny so we built it the dimensions to be wall to wall now the producer of the podcast couldn't actually even be inside the room yeah the, what, the, because the cameras were backed up hmm. against it um and so that started uh and then about three four months in it, it did way better than we could have imagined and from there um we decided to get a slightly bigger room and it sort of just evolved that way to yeah. what it is now in in the yeah. in in the come up, at what point do you realize this is like uh, could be a career? It was before I moved to London, and it was like the first time that I'd received a um, a paycheck through that was in the thousands. Like I'd received like a lot of two hundred, three hundred pounds, and I was there. Like, I, I was still like I'm going to uni. I'm going to uni. This is a great like side hustle. I'm yeah. making a bit of cash here, but then not long before that I got a check through and it was for, I think it was for like around about 2000 pounds. Sure. And the first thing I did was I just went on Google and I searched how much does it cost to live in London or like how much do I need to earn to live in something like that? Mm -hmm. And I was just underneath, I think it said something like 26,000 pounds or something like that. Um, And I was just under that. I was like 24,000 and I was like, I'll make it work. And so right then and there, I booked my flights to London and then I was there like, oh, I need to find a place to stay. Now, bear in mind, I've never rented, trying to go and rent a place that you have no history of renting. I I had like one of them like children's debit cards. So even just trying to like show printing off statements, I've never had to do any of that. I, all, mm-hmm. the, the most I ever had in that account was like 100, 200 pounds. And so then trying to convince in London, be like, no, nah, I'm making money now. Like you can trust me on this. Um, yeah, that was pretty tough. Convinceous. And yeah. what, what's drawing you to London at that point? It's just that you're there. These people you're chatting to online yeah. and they're living there and you just feel like that's where the scene is and where you want to, where you need to be. To that, be that's that exactly it. Yeah. A, a lot of my friends were all down there. Anytime there was ever any events. Um, and back then it was like call of duty events and things like that. I was there like, that's where it is. Like, I need to just live down there. All my friends are there. And when we start to pick on like the videos that we do where there's more of us together, the better it performs. Like we need to be in a closer vicinity and I needed to be, we got, I lived in Scotland at the time. So it wasn't like, Oh, let me just take the train down. Like <laughs> not really worth it. So I needed to move down there and that, that was really my goal. Yeah. I think that's a really, when I look at your videos, collaboration is yeah. just like fundamental to so much of it. Can you talk a little bit about that? Like, why is it important? Yeah, uh, I think it's it's very different in uh, like country dependent in the sense that, so in the US, collaboration is very different to the way collaboration is seen over in the UK. In the UK, you never charge it like, if a friend comes on your channel, there's no money exchanged. It is purely a, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours mm-hmm. type of scenario. Um, and it's amazing the way it works in the UK. There's a much tighter knit community. Collaboration is absolutely key um, to really scaling anything. I mean, you can take it as far as you can just by yourself, but eventually you need other people's viewers at some point. Um, and, 
that could be like, you know, having a guest on a podcast, like that's a collaboration. Right? Sure. So yeah, it, 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 it's been absolutely key. And we, we noticed it because people wanted to see all of us interacting. They'd been watching us individually. And that's what happens. A lot of time they watch individual people. And so then when they find out that those two people are meeting up, they go, I have to watch that video. So yeah, I mean, I can't, I can't express how important collaboration is, um, but it is at the same time, very important to have your own thing going on as well. You can't just purely rely on, on that side of things. And ultimately you won't have any form of, of longevity if you don't have your own sort of individuality in the space. Um, but collaborating is, it's more fun too, at least for me anyways. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What's the first couple of like eight examples when you start to realize that honestly right from the beginning like we used to play call of duty together and so i so the way it used to work like th this is the very first type of collaboration was there would be a bit of gameplay mm -hmm. um and i would in invite somebody to be on a skype call with me and we would both commentate sure my call of duty gameplay and so that was my very first bit of collaborating and people they're like oh this is awesome it's not just him talking he's now making jokes and having fun with someone else so that was the first bit and then it just sort of evolves from there yeah. And to make them successful, is it enough just to have those people in it or are they then actively promoting it on their channels? It, I, I mean, I never, ever have an expectation for the person to promote it on their channels mm -hmm. uh, ever. Um, I think once you start having that, you, you, you're almost collaborating as well, slightly for the wrong reasons to once it gets to that. It's like the only reason why I've got you on is to access your audience and not to make the best content possible. And ultimately that's what matters if the and and i think now more than ever good content performs well and people people will always try and make excuses for that and it's i believe it's one of like the hard-hitting truths if i have a video that doesn't perform well i know that it's my fault and it it's it's heartbreaking at times because I'll, I'll feel like i'll put out a great video and in my head but i'll come back in two months and i'll go like i need to figure out why did this video do a half a quarter of the views that i thought it was going to do and then you watch it back two months later and you go it just wasn't that great it just wasn't that good yeah um one of the people behind the camera there mentioned about the hamster video sure. that i did and that that for me is almost like the best example of why that video did so well. I can go back to it today and watch it and I'm there like, this is this is sick. Like, I'm so glad I did, this is amazing, I love it. And then I can go back and look at one that didn't perform well and I, I can just look at it and I go, yeah, it, it makes sense. It's not and, and the way, I mean, YouTube, th that is sort of maybe the platform that I'm most familiar with. So when I'm speaking about things, maybe have a have a hint of bias toward, towards YouTube, but, um, now more than ever, YouTube rewards good content because it understands that that is what is trying to feed their users. It's just the best content possible and it's trying to marry up the best content possible with what the user wants to watch. And so when you can give the user what they want to watch and the quality is super high, you have a, you have a recipe for a really good video. Yeah. So let's talk about the, the process. How do you come up with video ideas and concepts and then execute them it's changed a lot because now it, there is much more of a science to it from back in the day it was just about doing whatever the hell you wanted and now it has to be a lot more calculated and you have to really think about it so the usual process will be right we need an idea we'll think about an idea and it can be an amazing idea but if we can't marry it up with a really good title and a thumbnail to accompany that we have to park it off to the side and it's heartbreaking. But a lot of the times you can, you might park something off and then in two months time you go, you might see someone else and you go, I can just sort of mix that title up a little bit. And that works for my really good idea. And that is a good title. So it's, it's a bit of a shame because I always like to think, Oh, with a really good idea, that should be enough to make a great YouTube video. But unfortunately it's just not the case. You need the full package. You need the title, you need the thumbnail. Now, even to this day, I break that rule more often than I, I would probably like. And I'll come up with a great idea. I'll film it. And I think one of the best examples of that was probably I did a video where I was a professional footballer for 24 hours and the video didn't perform amazingly. It did okay, but it, it, it didn't do as good as it should have done. 
for what it was. And so looking at that, I think it it doesn't have a great thumbnail and it, it has an okay title. And I think that just reflects in the views. I watched the video and I think, yep, it is a good video. It's nothing spectacular. But looking at all three of those components, which is the final video, the thumbnail and the title, it makes sense as to why it got those views. Um, and so throughout that process, it's idea, title, thumbnail, video content. And then in the editing process, it's all about optimizing things, trying to figure it out. But in a slightly weird way, YouTube is not going backwards, but it's really starting to reward authenticity versus Mr. Beastifying videos. And that might, people might not understand what that is, but it's just, we like, it's like retention hacking is what we call it, is where there's a cut every three seconds or just something ridiculous like that in order to keep people hyper engaged to, to reward them with something new constantly. Um, but we're starting to see a real influx now of kind of the opposite of that. You know, there's a, there's a really interesting case of this, somebody in the U S called Sam Sulek. I don't know if have you seen his stuff. I'm not, I'm not. He's a he's a fitness guy, and he's yes, I have a very young yeah, guy, yeah, and have. he is huge, right? This bloke is jacked, and he is you know he's he's on stuff, right? But he makes sort of like 45, 50 minute long vlogs, and it's super sincere, super honest. He's not selling you anything. He's just he's just him, right? And people love it. You know, every single day he's uploading, he's doing between sort of 500K to 800K views. Uh, it might even be a million by the time this comes out. I don't know. But people have really created an emotional attachment to his content. And I think that is very much where we're starting to see things go. I mean, Mr. Beast has spoken about how he started to slow down his content as well, because I think he just went too far in one direction. Yeah. And that's totally fine. Um, I, I, I had gone through a period, actually, if you go into my um, maybe 2022 catalog of videos and you watch all those videos, they are done in the Mr. Beast format and they are my best performing video. That year was extremely successful for me um, because I understood how to make a good video in, in the sense of how to, how to make people want to watch more of it and for longer. I got to the end of 2022 and I looked at it and I just thought, I don't really, I don't want to make those yeah. videos. And it's really hard because I know those are the videos that do well. But at some point I, I had to look at those and go, I just don't really want to make that type of content. And so at the beginning of this year, I really wanted to marry up two passions of mine, which were travel and food. And I decided to do a trip to Tokyo and we went over there. We filmed, I think, three different videos. And it was a little bit unfortunate because at the same time I went to Tokyo, about three other creators had gone there. Like Ryan Trayan had just gone there. And so I knew and I was there like, well, I have timed this so badly. And no matter what, when you go over there, you're going to have crossover and content. And, and even to the point where it's like the same video. So we went over there. We filmed three videos and they did OK. Um, it was it was because my channel hadn't really been used to that. They didn't start off very well, mm -hmm. but because YouTube is constantly trying to find the right audience for your video, it's constantly pushing it to new people. And the moment it finds the right group of people for it, sure. it starts pushing it out. And so it took a while for that moment to come. But now those videos, we call them chuggers, right? Yeah. And they have just chugged and chugged and chugged and they've actually performed pretty well. But at the, when it, they first started, uh, went up, I was there like, damn, these have done terrible. Yeah. But because it wasn't quite my usual audience, it, it, it didn't do so well to begin with. How do you, how do you think about your content? So you said, um, you know, earlier about collaborating and not just uh, creating content that, I don't know, is like copying other people or just you're, you're relying on just having other people on uh, to bring in the views. And I've heard, Jay from, from Zach and Jay show talk about frameworks with their content where they would think around, you know, things that people would love to do, but don't have the balls to actually do, or just trying to transfer energy with their content. Um, do you have any kind of frameworks or things that you think about and how do you think your 
content is like authentically you? What is it that that people come for? Yeah, I mean, it's actually something. It's funny that you bring that up because it's it's something. And we had we had a meeting about six weeks ago addressing that exact thing. Um, because if you go on my channel right now, you look at it, and if I were to ask a viewer and say, "What video am I uploading next?" They would go, "Shit." It could be a travel video. It could be a video of you and your friends messing around. Like the list is endless. And so that's something that we're really trying to niche down on. And we really need to figure out, like I mentioned at the beginning of the year, I was very keen on doing travel and food, but because it didn't resonate very well with my audience, I sort of parked that off to the side. And I was like, we might have to revisit that sometime. But as the year went on and seeing how those videos have done, it's one of those where it's like, maybe I just need to go all in balls deep and not bottle it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Don't pussy out if something does badly and just believe that it's going to, it's going to work out. Um, so to answer your question is I actually don't, I don't have the answer mm-hmm. and I'm looking for that. Yeah. Um, and I think it can be really difficult because we all, I know what will perform really well and I can go and film a bunch of those videos tomorrow, but it's not actually the content that I want to make. And I think one of the re- biggest reasons for burnout is that people love the numbers and, and that's totally fine because everybody goes through that stage where you are refreshing your YouTube studio or whatever analytics app that you're using. People get addicted to that and that's great and you will love that for a couple of years, but then it gets to the point where you might have a couple that don't do well and then you have to fall back on the, on the, on the love of making a video. Mm -hmm. And when you realize that you don't love making those videos, you actually love the numbers that you were getting from those, those videos, you end up in a world of trouble. So you have to, you have to really find a balance there between loving a video performing well and actually just enjoying the content that you're making. And so for me, like I mentioned with that meeting that I had with our team, I literally said to him, I was there like, look, we can go and film. I call them white wall videos. It's the ones where it's like um, a friend of mine versus like a hundred women and they're dating. And like, look, those are going to go and do a million plus views. That's going to bang. But I don't love making that Mm. video. So it's the creator's dilemma. It's like what the algorithm wants, what you want. But is there a sweet spot in the middle? I don't know. I actually don't know if there is sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's it. That's it. But the only way that I'm going to continue being able to do this for a job is just relying on enjoying doing it. It's the only way that I'm going to continue doing it for, you know, I've been doing it 13, 14 years now. It's a like, I need to just keep doing it the way I, that I've always done it. Yeah. And that's probably why I'm still around now versus having sacked it off before. Yeah. Let's talk about some of the numbers as well mm-hmm. along the journey. What what are the What are the points where you just start seeing... Uh, meaningful revenue and then like mind-blowing ad sense and stuff like that. Do you, do you remember any of those moments? Not really. I, I'll be honest with you, like my ad sense and stuff like that, it's never, I tell you, it, it, it's a weird one because I, I, I'm also well aware that I'm in a bit of a bubble and the people that I speak to, they probably, you know, there is a lot of money on, on, on ad sense, but I don't know, just the people that I surround myself with, it's like, they're also making a lot. So I'm not too sure what is, what is considered mind blowing, but I mean, it was very regular to have sort of 30, 40,000 pound months. Um, but when people, it, it's another classic case though of people, oh, 30, 40,000, but mate, you're, you're laughing. Like, it's like, right, okay, but I've got a bunch of people I need to pay. Each one of those videos are costing me between five and 10 grand to make. Um, all of that, you know, so it does rack up and, and that's where you have to really have more, maybe more of a, a business approach to it yeah. and understand that, you know, okay, you might walk away with maybe 10,000 pounds in profit there. You want to reinvest 5,000 of that, you know, just loads of, loads of little bits there. So let's talk about that. Um, what the, the, the video where you throw the funeral for KSI's hamster. Yeah. I mean, the, partly let's talk about the concept, but also that might be a good one for the costs involved and the planning involved. Like mm-hmm. you're hiring a church, there's a choir, there's a priest. I'm not sure if he's real or not. Yeah. Like what's, how does that video come to be? And also how do you produce it? Cause it, it, people might think it's just you, but it's, there's a lot of people involved. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the most important thing that I can stress is that it was, it's not just me there. Um, we were sat at a uh, cafe myself, uh, head of content and then uh my producer and she look 
she comes up with the weirdest and the wildest video ideas and i'll be honest about 90 percent of them get shot down within about five seconds but this was her video idea yeah so she she said oh what uh didn't like someone in the office had mentioned that like jj's hamster had just died and she said oh, why don't we just ho- host a funeral for it and i and instantly i was there, like no like wh- what are you talking about like that me and the head of company, we put it just like oh, what are you talking about right and we left it for about 10 minutes and then I just sat there and I was there like, that would be really funny. <laughs> like it would be hilarious. And so instantly from there, I went, her name's Amrita. She's an unbelievable at her job. And I went to her and I was there like, all right, the only way this works, because this hamster is just, a, this has to be made and uploaded within two weeks. If this goes any longer than two weeks, it's a flop. So we have two weeks to make this video. We need to get a church and we need to make sure the church is in central London because I want loads of YouTubers coming to this. I need to have JJ come into it as well. And they're not going to trek out for a shoot that we have to make this as convenient as possible in order so we can fill the seats as best we can. And she just looked at me like, I could tell she regretted coming up with this idea. Yeah. And from there, head of content, he, he shoots, he, he went through that. And I believe he brought in an, a, an external team as well to do this just because there was a lot of people that needed to be involved with a video like this. Um, I don't give credit to, to, to someone called Con who stepped in um, and helped out. Um, and yeah, so we went through the entire process of getting the church and we managed to get a church like central London. I forget the name of the church. And they were amazing. They let us do this, which first of all, by the way, if you're trying to do like a, a fake funeral in a church, like that's a really sensitive thing. And that was actually something we were also really aware of is that this could potentially backfire really badly on us. We were, and I'll be honest with you. I think the fact that the video was, was as good as it was kind of brushed any of that under mm. underneath. And also just like, I have a laugh guys fucking cheer up man. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, we went through that whole process um, and it was expensive. It was definitely one of my more expensive videos, but I knew if this was going to work, it needed to be done really well and it needed to be done perfectly. Now, a lot of times I'll call in favors if it's, it needed to be done quickly or I'm just not in the mood to spend thousand pounds on something. So for example, the choir that you mentioned there, I meant, uh, I messaged Max uh, Fosh mm. who is, doing such an amazing job on youtube right now but at the time i was like mate i remember seeing a clip of you on a podcast saying that you have a choir yeah (laughs) are you still part of that choir and two is there any chance that they could come and do this (laughs) and he was there like I need a bit more information, maybe like what are you wanting us to do? And I had to explain <laughs> the idea of a hamster funeral. And I can only imagine, I would have loved to see his face when he like was listening to the voice. Yeah. That time. But credit to him. He was there like, yep, we'll be there. Da, 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 da. They turned up. I, uh, we paid them, um, but it wasn't anything, you know, hefty. And I think that's probably because Max managed to pull a few, few strings for us because they were unbelievable. Um, and yeah, so that's how that, that sort of came to be. And uh, again, credit to to harry my head of content and he turned that video around so fast um because like i said i was like this needs to be done in two weeks otherwise we're gonna miss the window yeah it's mega talk to me about your relationship with the with the side men what what's that been like what's up guys hope you are good hope you're enjoying this episode this is a very quick message to say two things one This episode and all of my content is made by my agency, 7xcontent.com. So if you would like to make amazing content or grow your podcast or just take what you're doing to the next level, then check us out. I would love to speak to you. The second thing to say is, if you've got this far in the episode, I would love to know what you think of it, who you would like to hear from on this podcast in 2024 and the types of questions that I can answer for you on this podcast because I want it to be so valuable that every episode is must listen so let me know what would make it that for you in 2024 now let's get back into the episode oh man it's it's the best and the reason why is because there is nothing more motivating than having people like that around you to to almost keep your dreams big that sounds so cheesy and so corny but it is it 
is so true to the fact that I get to look across and I get to see them doing all this amazing stuff. And I, and I get to ask myself, why am I not giving this a go? Or I've had this idea for ages. I should just give it a go. And I, and to be able to do that is awesome. And then not only that, but I can, I have great people that I go to and chat about things to be like, I'm thinking about doing this. Do you think it'll work? They're like, oh, well, we actually already tried that and it didn't do well. Or it's like, hey, if you're going to do that, make sure you do this, you know? So it's awesome to have friends like that, that can just give you a bit of a steer or give you a hand with certain things. Um, but yeah, in terms of, I mean, it's a weird one because I've made it sound quite like businessy there, uh, but I mean, we've all been friends for, for 12, 13 years now. And that's not something where it's a like, oh, you know, in the last couple of years, I really got to know these guys. It's like, no, nah, we were all sitting in Skype calls for 24, 48 hours. That was back then where as long as there's one person in the Skype call, it never ended. And we would always try and break records, see how long we could keep it going. I think we had one going for like a week and there was a, somebody in that call the whole way around. And we used to sit there day and night playing games together. You would be, you'd be in a Skype call. You'd say, Hey, uh, give me like 10 minutes. I'm going to go record a pack opening. I'll be back, drop out, come back jump on GTA, whatever it was. It's amazing. Um, and it's just mental to see what they've achieved, but also the fact that I get to, I get to see it all and, and, and see how much effort they put into it. It's pretty nuts. What do you think are the biggest lessons you've, you've learned from them? What do you think they do really well? What's, what's special? You cannot deny that having a group of seven guys all harmoniously working in an environment like that with the amount of money that we're talking about as well to stay together for 10 years. I mean, how long was One Direction together? Do you know what I mean? In terms of like boy groups, boy bands, these lot have outlasted anyone. Yeah. Like, and, and we're not talking about like, oh, they just do this on the side for a bit of fun. It's like, no, we're talking about millions and millions of tens of millions of pounds involved here. And they're all still getting along. They're all they all get it. They understand what it is. Every, everything is just split evenly. There's everybody leaves their ego at the door when it comes to, to this business. And that's the reason why it's worked. And this wouldn't have worked. It would have been very easy for someone like KSI who was in the position that he was in could argue maybe like Harry or someone at the time as well, when he was, you know, at arguably bigger than JJ at that time. Right. And it's very easy for them to go on. If they had gone in with maybe more of a business mindset, you could say they would have gone in and said, I want 30%. He gets 30%. You're smaller than me. You can have 15%, whatever it is. And then you have this weird shift. And I promise you, if that was the case, the side men would not be here now. So it's the fact that they all left their egos at the door and they said, the only way this works is if this is just split evenly across it. And that has been such an important lesson to me, um, doing any venture possible. It's like, you have to leave that there and you just have to, if, if you're going to do something w with somebody down the middle. Yeah. How do you think, obviously JJ manages that? Cause he's like the spearhead I don't know if he, he's the spearhead for his own journey. He's not the spearhead sure. for the side man. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I think it would be really unfair to, to give him that, that title for the side man, sure. because those boys, everybody puts in equal amount yeah. of work and that, and that's really how it works. And you're right in terms of, you know, if you look at everybody individually, it's like, absolutely, this guy has gone above and beyond, but it's also because that's really what he wanted. Mm -hmm. He wanted that, that mainstream access. He wanted to be there and it might sound a bit weird, but you could probably speak to most of the other guys and they'll all tell you like what he's got. They don't want anything to do with that. Mm. And I don't blame them. Do you know what I mean? Like it's, you have to really want that in order to go for it. And, and what JJ has achieved is mind boggling and it takes like a real level of determination. And he, I mean, he's been speaking about being where he is now for years and the, the idea of being where he is, I mean, we've got some hilarious stories of things like, don't worry, bro, in three years when I'm here, there's going to be no problem. Like just stuff like that. He would say stuff like that. And I'm there like, oh, okay, whatever, bro. Like that. And it's here now. And, and, sure. and it's like that. And yeah, it's... What's an example of that? Is, is he basically practicing the law of attraction there? Is he saying like, I'm going oh, yeah. to, I'm going to, this I'm guy gonna be rinses like that. Yeah. Man. He rinses like manifestation, law of attraction. This guy, he just like, he's the king of that. Absolutely. It's, it's, I, I need to do more of that, but I worry that by doing that, 
it almost comes across as arrogance. And I used to sometimes think that I'd be like, fuck man, he's so like, not, not, I think arrogance may be the wrong word, but he's so confident. How can you be that confident? You, you don't know. Like, you don't know that's going to happen. And then sh- fucking hell, sure as hell, like, that shit happens. So, like, yeah, it was, it's, I, 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 need, I need to learn from that for sure. And I still, I still don't do nearly enough of, of that type of stuff. Yeah. What do you think's next for him? How far is he, is he going to take it? I don't even know. It depends, man. The prime stuff looks sweet. I'd, I'd cut out. I'd sell, I'd sell, sell my shares and I'm off, man. I'm off. You don't need to see me anymore. <laughs> but that's the thing with him. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, we, we, all of us, we all have regular uh, dinners and we, we're all in group chats. We're always talking and stuff. But I think that's, he, he likes to, he has this weird thing. He likes to surprise us. Like, I know that sounds weird, but it, it, he'll drop, like, for example, what was it that Prime had collaborated with? Arsenal, was it? Or Barcelona? Oh, mate, it was, or... it was wait, wait. <laughs> Yeah, like, it was nuts. And then we all just put in the chat, like, uh, lol, is this real? Yeah. And it wasn't the official night. It was, like, a leak. And we put this in, like, lol, is this real? And and he just replied with, like, uh, yeah, I, like, I was going to wait and, and show you guys. But I wanted, like, he... he loves like surprising us and then like surely you just tell us that you're partnering with xyz and i don't know he's just he's a different breed man yeah i've heard you say before which i think is interesting like this this whole thread around like your relationship with them and even when we talked about the the ad sense i was like you're like it's big but it's not anything compared to these other people i'm around and i heard you say you still you feel like you've got something to prove uh, I think you were t- talking to Jordan. Yeah. Um, what do you mean by that? And is, and is that really what the fellas is? Yeah, I have something to prove. And I think it's a weird one. I, I, I think it is it's to prove to myself ultimately more than anything. Um, and I understand that I'm very much in a bubble and people tell me, oh, like, you know, you should be really proud of of what you've achieved so far, I've really struggled to look back or, or see anything that I have currently and be there like, wow, this is this is really cool or you should be you should be proud of this. And a lot of that I think is down to the fact that I've just, this is all I've ever known. This is all I've ever grown up with. I've always been surrounded by these guys. They have always been pushing the limits and I'm, I'm, I'm there, I'm, I'm on the boat. You know, I'm on the boat. We're all going on this boat. Um, and to me, that's all I've ever known. And so I haven't actually achieved anything yet that I can look at and I can go like, that's fucking badass. You know what I mean? And the fella studio stuff, that might be what it ends up being. I mean, I have a really great vision for that. Uh, I'm super confident about the direction that we're heading with that. And who knows, maybe it gets to the point where it's like, yeah, that that's cool, but it's, it's nowhere near, I, I don't feel that in, at all at the moment with it um so yeah let's talk about that then so the fellas it starts as a podcast you and chip Mm -hmm. i think you're like begging him to do this for quite a long time yeah yeah i mean i I was on my knees (laughs) i was on my knees for him to do this podcast and i'd want to i went on true geordie's podcast a, uh, a while ago and I loved it. I was there like, man, podcast so cool. And I was sitting around waiting. I was there like, when's he going to invite me on again, man? Like I had so much fun on that podcast. <laughs> that was the only podcast ever, that was in that space that I was ever going to be invited on. And I was there like, damn, man, I'm waiting for the next one. Like that was sick. Um, and then I was like, oh, it's got to a point now I, w- I want to do one. And I, w- I said, look, Chip, do you want to do one with me? He says, no, not interested. <laughs> and they're like, oh, okay, fine. Parked it for a bit couple of months later like still do one man anyways this happened for like six months and like around that six month mark i went come on bro let's just let's just try this podcast if you don't like it, you don't like it and he went nah man i'm going to la and i'm joining phase shit i was like what you, like really and he was like yeah i've been i've been speaking to uh to phase banks who's like the mm. guy at the time that ran phase and he was like, yeah, it's like pretty much going to happen. I'm going to fly out there in a few weeks and I think I'm going to go and live over there. I was there like, all right, well, fine. Like, you know, I can't really argue that. Like, I'm not going to do a podcast, you know, any like, with you over there. I was there like, yeah, I mean, if you're going to tell me no, this is a pretty cool way to tell me. Like, uh, and then 
the gods. Well, actually, no, let me not say that because that makes it sound like a positive thing, but COVID rocked up. Yeah. Right? <laughs> the COVID rocked up and all the airports and everything shut down. Like completely everything was locked off. And he was there like, yeah, I can't go to LA anymore. The whole phase situation started to get a bit weird and deteriorated and kind of fell apart, sadly. Um, and I was there like, I think it's time we give this podcast still, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. still on the table man. he was there like <laughs> i remember he, he he called me i think yeah he, he called me and he was just like all right like i'll do it and i was there like no way like really and he was there like yep and then like i mentioned earlier he gave me that one condition that it had to be in a set it had to have a set so it's got this yeah it's ha- so and then from that it, you kind of start it on this set it costs like five grand in this really cramped room was it a, a hit from day one or? It, yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, it was. <laughs> no, 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 it wasn't, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a hit, but it did do really well. Like, yeah. you know, I can't, I can't deny it did, it did better than at least what we were expecting at the time for mm. sure. And we were there like, wow, this is, this is awesome. Yeah. It, it did. Do what well. was your concept though? What was the concept in your head? It was like, it's just, it's going to be us two. We're going to entertain, going to shoot the shit, talk about what's happening this week in the world and like, just have a good time and hope people enjoy it. In a really shallow way, we it was an excuse for us to just get really drunk and <laughs> yes. just chat shit, honestly. And I think, yeah, like there, there was no real like business side to it. I didn't even know if you were you were going to make that much money doing podcasting. Mm-hmm. I, it, it, that side of things didn't really bother me. I just knew I wanted to do one. Mm. Um, and I think that kind of comes back again to just like um, loving the content that you're making. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't drink as much anymore. But back then, like we were, we were getting like pretty fucked up every single episode, <laughs> and and I think people like people love that. Yeah, people love seeing that happen. Um, but it would be weird. Like the first the first hour of the pod would be like really good, and then it would just descend into chaos. And yeah. they're like, I can't listen to the last half hour of this. It's unbearable. <laughs> and I'm the, I don't know how people do it. Like I don't know how people listen to the full thing. And yeah, fair enough to them. They they did. Yeah, and then what's that evolution of it? Because you get offered a deal from Spotify. Yeah, how does that happen? It, it was actually a running joke in our in our podcast. We, we were there like, oh, you know, when we get our Spotify bag, like, think like, you know, I'm not even too sure I'm going to be in the UK anyway. We, we would joke about all this sort of stuff for ages, and someone from Spotify had reached out to us only like maybe two months after doing our first episode, and was there like, hey, just want to introduce myself um you know if you guys got any questions whatever just want to say congrats like he sent us like just in case you guys didn't know you're like number three in the charts or something like that i forget what position it was uh and we were like oh that's pretty cool and we were like oh that's also pretty cool that someone from spotify reached out and has noticed what we're doing here maybe we are doing something right when that was it we didn't hear from for like eight months yeah eight nine months and then they reached out and they were there like, would you be interested in doing some sort of exclusive deal? And we were, it, I mean, I messaged him and we were so excited. We were there like, there's no way, like we'd been joking about this for ages. It's like, this is so funny that, and and maybe that again goes back to the manifestation thing that yeah. I mentioned, but like, I was there like, this is so funny. And I don't want to say that like a Spotify deal isn't, doesn't isn't like amazing now but certainly back then it really had it was it was much more rare and it was like a big deal the only person that had done or the only person the most the biggest case was the joe rogan one and and so anybody that was getting a deal like it was like wow you yeah. get in a spotify deal this is wow. crazy yeah. that was like a what was it a hundred million or something mad yeah and but well it's, it's mad Rude. but I, I would say that was unbelievable business from spotify oh yeah like it's Joe Rogan, one. I think, will be looking back at that thinking, I probably should have got a bit more out of mm. that. But like at the time, mate, you're snapping it's, it's snapping yeah. hands up for that, right? <laughs> um, because just the, the the space and where podcasting has come from from then. But yeah. Um yeah, we get that Spotify deal. And um yeah, it's been it, yeah, the two years that we did it. What when's this coming out? This will come out December or January? What what what's the best better answer there? What can okay, you tell if, us? This, if this comes out before the no, if this comes out after the twelfth of December, we're no longer with Spotify. Okay, so we we, we had a two year deal with Spotify, um, and that ran ran its course. Um, 
we had some chats about extending that. They mm-hmm. were quite keen to do that, but um, with everything that we're doing at the Fella Studios, I really wanted to be independent. Yeah, to bring it back. Um, but working with Spotify was just the sickest thing ever. Like the people that work there, the the platform itself. Like I love it. I love the brand. I love everything about Spotify. Um, and also just super grateful for the opportunity that we had to 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 work with them and they they i mean at that time when we did that deal like what a moment it was for me and me and chip so yeah spotify were were awesome but it just because of the way the business that we're trying to create it makes a little bit more sense for us to go independent let's talk about that because you're not just one podcast you're now 12 13 yeah so at the time of doing this i think we're at 13 how does that happen um it happens because we had created the fellas podcast and we'd done it. Um, and it was actually from the Spotify deal. Uh, we had signed it. We were getting a good chunk of money coming in. And from me and me and Chip, we both have our own YouTube stuff. So we actually saw that money that we were getting in there. And we said, we don't actually need it. Like, look, it's great to have. It looks fucking awesome in the bank account, but we should probably do something with this because otherwise, this podcast is just going to run its course and what are we going to have to show for it in five years? So we said, right, we're going to take our Spotify money here and we're going to create podcasts for other people. Chip is very, very much a creative and also, I call him like, it's like a technical creative. He will spot a mistake in anything. And he is so like, to the smallest detail, he he has a thing for it, which is great because I'm actually nothing like that. Um, And if you watch our YouTube videos, you'll actually see that like he he will take three months maybe to get a a masterpiece out. But when it comes out, you're like, wow, whereas me, I very much value efficiency and get just, you know, getting things done. I value execution over anything. So I was there like, and, and it works really well because he does his thing and I do my thing. Um, we looked at our podcast and we we're like, we can just do this for more people. Like we really believe we know what makes a podcast tick. And so the first one that we brought on was a show called Pitch Side. And the reason we had Pitch Side was because it was just two of our friends and we were there like, if it goes tits up, it's not too bad. Like we can yeah. give this a go, you know? Yeah. So we got a space. We decided it was a football show, um, brought them on. And yeah, we sort of, started with that one and then our next show from that was one called saving grace um which is an uh, a wildly popular one now within her demographic um and she's done such a great job it's such a amazing person to work with as well uh, extremely hard working actually it's it's very easy to look at tiktok people and just think what the fuck do they do but she's she her schedule's crazy um and so yeah we just built out shows from there and somehow we're now at 13 ish yeah what are the fundamentals that are making this so i'm i'm thinking when i'm looking at it i'm like the the sets visually they're stunning um they're like personality led the personalities are brilliant like uh gk parry Mm -hmm. uh etc um the distribution is is amazing as well there's the social clips the tiktoks the shorts what do you think makes a winning uh, podcast or they're really like shows that you're making, I guess? Yeah, it's it, it's a combination of everything that you mentioned there. We very much are, well, we are entirely video led. So, the, and that was one of the things that Chip was, was early on to. The fact that his one stipulation was there needs to be a set. And that all stemmed from it has to look good on camera. People are now consuming podcasting very much through video. And if we're not doing that, I mean, for me, like, you know, I was more than happy to have two chairs in a room and doing that. And that's cool. And that works. And that's great. And and that suits a certain audience. But our demographic are on TikTok. Our demographic are are consuming things that need video. Um, Podcasting naturally has awful discovery. Like, Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And that's not their fault because that's not what they're there to do. And it's super difficult. But your discovery on platforms like YouTube, like TikTok, like Snapchat, you know, is far greater. So, you know, all of those, they don't do audio only. Uh, Ah, YouTuber getting into it, I think, with podcasting. But, um, you know, for those social platforms, 
we needed something extremely strong on video. And so that is uh, such an important focus. And we invest a lot of money. I mean, I'm talking every single show, there'll be tens of thousands of pounds spent on each individual set. And we just value it so highly. Um, yeah, and I think that's a, that's a really important thing for us. And how do you plan the individual episodes? Because again, people would think maybe you're just showing up and then shooting the shit, but is there a bit more of a strategy to it than that? Absolutely. I mean, uh, every show has a producer um, and they will do pre-show notes um, depending on what the podcast is about, what's it like, uh, it, are we talking trending topics, is it, is it something else? Um, and like you said, a lot of it is personality driven. So sometimes we react to things, but that's all very much on the producer to come up with um, those bits. And, you know, everyone has group chat. So it's encouraged, like the talent will be like, oh, remind me to tell this story on the podcast this week or remind me to talk about this thing, da, 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 whatever it is. Um, but yeah, very much. I mean, we um, in our shooters, we have like, screens that hang down from the ceiling and on there will just be show notes. Um, and at least for the fellas, each one is slightly different. But for the fellas, it is very much social driven. We will not pre-plan clips, but we'll definitely pre-plan plan topics for that we know will perform well um, on social media. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I was watching their end of year awards uh, last night, and that was hilarious. Yeah, thank Just you. the reactions to the clips and stuff, and like, yeah, the whole format was genius. Yeah, so that's credit to our producer. Uh, or he goes by the name Prodi C. But yeah. Um, yeah, like he spends a lot of time, you know, these guys, they really, we invest a lot of money into every single show. Um, and, and that actually all stems from the crux of the, the reason why we started the business, um, which was not, every, not, not everybody has the capital to go and invest 50 to 100,000 pounds in the first year of a podcast. Like that's pretty steep. Yeah. Um, we were very fortunate that we had disposable income, but we understand a lot of creators, you know, they might have a lot of numbers, but that doesn't necessarily translate to money in the bank yeah um, like like saying cash is, is what uh, someone i know says <laughs> yeah I, it's so true though it's you know you'd be you'd be amazed as to how many people have these audiences but they're really struggling to monetize them and i think podcasting is a great way of doing that so we take the risk on we make the investment and we're very we're very selective about who we choose to bring on to to the so what's the format there? Basically, you find the talent and then you say, like, we'll front the costs and then split the revenue 50-50 or the, the profit 50-50? Yeah, it is, it is, work, it is based off of a, a revenue split. Um, it's always in the creator's favor. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the time people, in the, it, it, it's interesting, in the industry, people are like, wow, like that split is very generous to the creator. Um, I mean, if you were to run any type of business, a 50% margin is pretty good going, right? Um, and so the fact that we're going beyond that and we take on all the costs. So, I mean, if you could go to somebody and you were there like, okay, you're going you're gonna to run this business and at the end of every single month, you're going to walk home with 70, 30, whatever percent it is, above 50%, you'd, you'd snap their hand off all day. You're like, that's a sweet margin. Um, and so we're the ones with the risk. It sits in our hands, but we're extremely confident in, in what we create and it's on us to perform as well. Um, and by us working in the model that we that we have, it's a win-win situation. Um, it can scare off a lot of top-tier talent in the sense that they're very used to, I call it quick cash. They're very used to, you know, a big company coming to them and going, here's 500,000 pounds. I want you to do a podcast for a year. And they go, all right, sweet. They do it, they build it up, they don't own any of it. The IP isn't owned, nothing, it sits with them. And little do you know, but the company has, has you know, made a profit of 500K, maybe six, 700K and you're, and you're there with your 500K and they can also just go, all right, you're done for the season. We're gonna go for this person next and, and sit in there. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So you, you, you don't actually own anything. And the, w I really wanted to create a, a, a talent creator friendly business model here because when like i said when we first started our podcast there's two roads you could go down the first road was you can do exactly what i just said and a company will go to you and be like we'll pay you a 70k salary a year and you can go on and do your podcast and that's it like cool you just cut your check and that's that um you don't own anything you know if if you want to scale it you're entirely at their mercy as to what they want to pay you 
it gets a little bit tricky and naturally as things if things do go well and they are successful you always come to that crossroads with the talent of they think they deserve more and the company wants to make sure they're making as much money as possible so you're always against each other and battling mm. um and then the other option is you just do it all yourself and you have to have the capital to do that you have to be willing to create a team a company like it's it's a it's, it's a lot effort. of work yeah there's yeah. a lot of work involved in that but no guarantee exactly uh, a lot of these people will also um their their creators they got other stuff to do you know they, there's a way of maximizing your money you can go and do all your shoots and things like that and then you turn up but you're still owning it you're still taking a revenue split and so that's that's we found the middle ground in between that and we think that's really important to um to the success because ultimately and 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 it's a, a case of if the talent and the creator is not happy then that's fine like it is that's that's our mistake yeah we there's a reason you're not happy maybe it's not monetizing well maybe it's not performing well but we wouldn't have selected that person if we didn't think it was going to do well so that's on us yeah absolutely how far do you think it can go what's your what's your vision for it i mean we have a lot of stuff in the works um we have it's I, I, it, it's hard to say we've got we've got some really important announcements over the next two months but i don't want to be that person that comes on a podcast and said oh we'll just wait for the announcement i, I hate this i hate you guys <laughs> uh, but it, in terms of where it can go i i actually love the idea of not knowing yeah. um, and the answer is i actually don't know where it can go and i think that's totally fine a lot of people will be there like oh yeah you, you know what, what's your what's your business plan for the next five years with this thing um and don't get me wrong like i have i have goals uh, 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 revenue targets, things like that. But it has to be more than that. And I also think people that do look five years ahead, it's a, like, it's, it, it's a little bit naive of you to assume that you know what the landscape's going to be like in mm -hmm. five years. Because I can promise you, like, if you look five years ago, the idea of making millions of pounds a year on a podcast is, yeah, didn't exist. Pretty, yeah, pretty unheard of. So in five years' time, the answer that I don't know. At the moment, I'm sort of working year by year. Yeah. Um, and we have within our company so we have um 26 25 people working with us at the moment um working at the fella studios we have our big christmas due tonight actually buzzing for that love that uh yeah we have 25 people um and at the end of every year we sort of you know the senior leadership team will come together and we'll have a meeting and we'll really strategize for what next year looks like and we've got that in about a week or two and that's a really important moment for us i think there's going to be a lot of strategy involved in it. We we were very much growth focused this year. Mm. Um, I think sort of halfway through next year. When, when I'm talking about growth, by the way, I'm talking about the the number of shows that we have under the mm -hmm. umbrella. Um, we, we obviously still want podcasts to be growing. That's that's a different conversation, but it's very much about being able to take a podcast and ultimately what we're trying to do and and. Fellow Studios is a podcast production company, but we're trying to create brands. And that for us is so important. And we believe that we have the podcast side of things like really nailed down. We're constantly experimenting, trying new things, and that will continue. But now we're at a stage where we need to branch out. We need to we need to find ways to really turn these things into brands. And and we are in the process of doing that, but I want to accelerate that next year. Yeah. I think I was on the train this morning and someone was saying, they're talking about Soccer AM yeah, and saying what a rubbish show that is now. I think they changed it to something else on Sky. It's gone now, I think. I think it's Saturday Social, they call it. Yeah, well, they, yeah. they, they, they were, uh, yeah, they, they weren't impressed with Saturday Social. <laughs> right, right. That's and I, I look at a lot of your shows there and I think like the Saving Grace thing just as a brand in its own is like proof that you can create something that can be so much bigger than just a podcast. I know... The, the live show has been immensely uh, successful as well. Yeah. And I think the same with like the Formula One one. That's just like a blue ocean. There's not really anyone doing too much there. Yeah. With so many of these shows, there's just, yeah, like they can be so much more than just a show. They can be a brand. They can be uh, a bigger media brand or, um, yeah, in-person events. God knows what. Yeah. Uh, I think there's a there's a hell of a, a hell of a lot you can do. It's really exciting. Yeah. I think that for us is going to be such a big thing in, in in next year. Is they're like, okay, so once we 
once we've built out a base and it's i actually think it's really important to to not go and do that stuff off the bat Mm. um if you if you skip the steps of building the foundations and the and, and the community then you end up sort of shooting yourself in the foot you're you're very thinly spread and the most important thing for us, and when we talk about building these brands, that, that will only work for a select few of the podcasts. But the aim is to get all the podcasts up to the point where it's like, right now, we're going to trigger this arm. Now, now we'll do this side of things. And like you said, like that might be a live show, merchandising, whatever it might be. You know, maybe it's coming out with a product. It can, it can be whatever it is, but we want to be the ones doing that. And a lot of the stuff is in-house. I think with the fellow studios as well i hate middlemen right <laughs> that, that i have seriously i have a real issue with middlemen and and what annoys me is that the creator the talent is always the one that gets fucked is always the one i mean it, it, it's funny that like, you know a deal gets all the way through and by the time it gets to creator most of the time i mean i would love to see some data on this but i'm willing to bet that by the time the deal, the 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 sum gets to the creator, it's probably around forty percent of what the actual client is paying. That it, it's staggering how many people are taking pieces out the pie. So for us, if we want to provide the maximum amount of value to the people under our network, under our umbrella, then we have to be we have to be getting rid of as many of those middlemen as possible. Otherwise we're not doing our shows justice here. So building out those teams next year are going to be really important for us. But at the same time, it's all very new to me as well. And I'm making sure that while I do want to be doing this quickly and I, I love to see numbers going up quickly, I'm well aware that I want to make sure this, this is done methodically and, and in the right way. And while maintaining the culture that we have at the fellow studios at the moment, yeah, um, because I love it. Yeah, no, I've uh, yeah, I've I've come across a lot of uh, these talent agencies and all this uh, kind of starting to work in this world, and yeah, it's mind blowing. Um, a lot of the time as well, it's just mind blowing how much I think is left on the table, or like emails go and left unanswered, and there's just like, um, yeah, I think, yeah, it, it it's a it's a strange world. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting that you mentioned talent management because that was actually something that came up in a conversation about actually the beginning of this year we one of the things that that we do is identify this talent i mean a great example would probably be grace um actually no well grace isn't let me not use grace because she was in a different situation she 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 had her management who are really really good um but you know if we take uh there's a lot of smaller creators out there that we're there like we love what you're doing we want to work with you and they're like okay cool so we work directly with them and they don't have any management and management are absolutely make or break in these things because for them if we go back to the to the 500k it, it they want to take that because they're getting their 15 20 percent cut of that it's much harder for them to see the vision and they don't like the idea of taking a, a, a lesser cut but they're part of something bigger. Mm -hmm. So a management will usually try to steer them towards these larger companies that will say, here's your 150K, yeah, cool, I'm, I'm taking my 20 grand for this deal, sweet. Do you know what I mean? So management are really make or break in these situations. And we thought, should we set up our a, a talent management arm of this and we can also manage them and we can sort of be encompassing here, mm -hmm. uh, all encompassing and really be that one-stop thing. We took like a month to think about it and we decided, you know what, that that's not the way to do this because we need to make sure we're niched down. We're still being the best at what we do. The moment we enter a space like the talent management space, things get messy. Things get messy. The incentives change. Yeah. Everything, everything completely changed and we're not going to be focusing on what we're here to do, which is make amazing shows, building awesome brands for the talent. Mm -hmm. So it, it, was, it was a weird one because it makes a lot of sense money wise why not like mate it's sitting there just go and do it but we had to take a step back and go you know what we have to we have to look further down the line don't do this what happens if talent aren't happy with with the deals that you're bringing them and so they don't want to be with you there 
that then affects your relationship that you have in the production side of things. And so it, there's just so many problems there. And we really had to just take the step back. And as attractive as as, as the money might look, it's important to, to see, see the longer term vision. Yeah. Let's talk about kind of your career today. What, what, what's been the, your biggest regret? Oh, my biggest regret. Not convincing Chip to do it earlier. No, <laughs> um, I don't. Oh, what's my biggest regret? That's such an interesting one. It's it's tough to regret anything because I'm still kind of, I'm still kind of here. I'm doing exactly what I want to do. I, I'm not thinking. Oh, I, I wish I'd given that a go. <sighs> There's been loads of little little moments. Like that, you know, you regret like, oh, maybe I should have done that deal or maybe, you know, maybe I should have said no to being part of this. Um, but there's definitely n never been like a career defining bit where I'm there like, oh, man, I look back on that. Like, that was a shame. Um, yeah, I, lots of little bits that you regret. But what about the lowest moment? The lowest moment was... I can remember it actually. It was, oh, how many years ago would that be now? Like five years ago. I was living in Bermondsey and I just remember I, w I was working there um, and I just wasn't, I, I was constantly out partying. I, I never went to uni, so I never got that experience of going out and just like the socializing aspect. And so that was very much me trying to play catch up. But it got to a point where I was like a year in and there was way more money going out than, than coming in. And that's because I wasn't focusing on work. Um, and I was, I just, I remember waking up one morning, like a little bit hungover. And I remember just thinking like, fuck, like this really can't go on for, for much longer. Like I'm going to have to sort things out. Um, and I remember like sat there on the edge of my bed. Like for some reason I woke up like crazy anxiety. And I was there like, like, I was actually more afraid of what my like my parents because I was the one that convinced them like yeah let me sack off the higher education let me come and do this I was there, like I've been down in London for like three years now there's no way I can go back like I I need to fix up whatever's gonna happen now like and it's got to be from now and what's really funny is that was at the end of a year and I remember the next year following that like I made so much money. And and that's I don't want to that I don't mean that to be like a in a, in a dick way, but just in the sense that I really switched it on, I really pulled back a lot of that stuff, uh, a lot of the partying stuff, and I just got dialed in. And at the end of that year, I went, that was pretty sick. Like, I remember looking at it. I remember looking at you know my bank account and just being there like, I now no longer. It it would have to be a monumental fuck up to be back where i was you yeah. know what i mean so and i was there like that's what happens if you actually just get shit done and you actually just work you yeah. know what i mean so that was a really eye-opening moment and it, it can be quite difficult because when you're your own when you're your own boss you, there's nobody telling you be there for work or you're going to lose your job mm -hmm. like, that doesn't really happen that what i had there was probably the closest moment that you're going to get to you're going to lose your job you know because i was there like shit like this is it this, yeah. this is this is a warning from the boss yeah right which is so the that for me was there like boom. And then ever since then, I always just think back to that moment and I'm glad, I'm really glad. And that's what I mean. Like I could say I regret that stuff, but yeah. not really because it's without that, then maybe I would have had that moment in a year's time and that would have been even scarier. Yeah, yeah. So it's there, like, I'm glad that that happened then for me. What was the number in the bank account? Before we get into it, 97% of people who watch this channel are not subscribed. It helps me more than you would know if you subscribe. If you get some value from this video, if you find it remotely interesting, please hit subscribe. It really helps push this content out to more people. Now let's get back to the episode. Uh, what, when I was on the ropes? Well, when you when you had the year that you you did you worked your socks off when I was got your shit together. There was um so what that would have been like three years ago. Um, there was hundreds of thousands of pounds in there. I can say that yeah, hundreds of thousand pounds. I hadn't hit the hadn't hit the million mark at that point, mm. but um, doing that made me realize this is this is this is possible. There should be no reason why I'm not at a few million quid and in a few years yeah um and so from there it was super motivating and yeah i, I you know what you, you mentioned like 
being proud of like what it, I, I was actually super proud that i'd managed to pull my shit together mm. and i think that's probably my proudest moment when i was there like yeah i didn't just like crumble when it went when it would have been very easy to be the you know go into the deep dark pits yeah <laughs> yeah let's um that's really cool let's uh let's do the quick fire questions yeah absolutely man best thing you've done with your money best thing i've done with my money um reinvest it into my own businesses yeah conversely the worst thing uh the worst thing uh spunk it all on nights out and oh what else i'm trying to think oh late tax bills pay a pay tax on time <laughs> um kindest thing someone's ever done for you kindest thing and you said quick fire as well i'm aware of that <laughs> um no i want to give you a good answer though uh the kindest thing someone's ever done for me it, it, it genuinely just the group of the group of friends constantly are they're there for you and and not even just like in an emotional way but anytime something's up you stick it in the group chat someone someone fixes it for you it's like having a a, a group of just like magical workers if the if there's any anything wrong someone steps in and says, let me sort that for you let me, let, let me help you fix that um and i just think constantly knowing that that's there is such a relief yeah top three books top three books are oh, loved shoe dog um, I'm in the middle of David Goggins' first book. Uh-huh. Um, and that's pretty wild. It's so American though. Um, and <laughs> Captain Underpants. Wicked. Uh, top three creators. Top three creators. Mm. Who, who am I watching right now? Grant Horvat. You're probably wondering who the hell Grant Horvat <laughs> is. And let me tell you, he's a golfing YouTuber. Okay, that I love we'll, to look watch. Him up. we'll look him up. Yeah, yeah. Well, in, if you're not into golf, you're going to struggle to enjoy the video. <laughs> but as, a, as a somebody that's really into the golf, love Grant. Um, I uh, love what Max Fosh is doing. Mm -hmm. um, enjoy his content, but I'm actually, in terms of like creator wise, I just love how into things he is. He's, mm -hmm. he's so, he's, he's really approached it from a science perspective and I, and I love that for him um and then i will go with harry rotashaw nice what's next for you next for me look i'm i'm doubling down i'm all in on fella studios right now there really is what's next for me is is taking that to the next level um it's such an important part of my life i probably spend about 80 percent of my time working on it um it's i love it i love i love having creators have a sense of pride about their show and knowing that I had a hand in help it, helping make that possible. And also, you know, we're making these people a lot of money and that also makes me happy too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's nice. It's yeah. a nice feeling. Yeah. What are you searching for? Financial freedom. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like, you know, those American podcasts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. harp on about that now. Um, what, what am I searching for? I am searching for, right now, actually, I'm searching for my health. And in that sense, I, I'm, I'm in good health right now. Um, but I'm very much in a space where I'm looking to optimize that. Yeah. Um, and not, gang. Yeah, exactly. But I'm also not talking about the geezer that spends like 2 million quid Brian Johnson yeah, yeah, on, yeah, yeah. on reverse age and stuff. I just mean I've taken a super big interest right now in my own health mm. and understanding my own body. And I guess I'm just searching. I understand there's never going to be an answer to that, but uh, there's certainly more understanding to come. Are you still drinking? Uh, I do still drink, but nowhere near. I did the 75 hard challenge. Uh -huh. And uh, I do drink. I don't think that will ever change. I, I enjoy the social aspect of it a lot. But certainly in terms of what was happening before, there's it's mm -hmm. nothing like that. Um, probably drink maybe once or twice a month. Yeah. And lastly, where can people find you? Um, in the office at the fellow studios. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, you could type in Cal Freezy onto YouTube, but um, if you want to check out my podcast, it's the fellas. It's a, it's a certain type of audience. You have to be into masturbating stories and, and things like that. So if that's not your cup of tea, then you can just check out the fellow studios, which is where we go and uh, hopefully create a podcast that does suit you. 
so you can check it out there awesome thank you very much thank you so much i really enjoyed this it was fucking sick thanks